Intergenerational trauma is the wounds that you have inherited. And you, we have that at five years old. Today, y'all, we brought one of my favorite authors on the conversation around trauma. We have a clinical psychologist in the building. We are in here rocking with Dr. Tamer. Welcome to Hardly Initiated. Is all trauma passed down or is it based on the level of intensity? Some of the things that you carry are not from your lifetime. Whether you have been treated well or not, you are worthy of love and of care. What is the right way to use religion to heal? I believe I can have a better life than I have right now. I'm motivated to have some of these conversations, but I'm, I'm not excited about it though. Right. <laughs> People want to jump past accountability and just get to kumbaya. Right, right. right. <laughs> to get to peace, we got to go through Welcome to Hardly Initiated. It is your host, Tyshawn Jackson, here with another episode of my co-host, Ryan Catches. I can already tell, man, it's going to be a powerful one right here. Very yeah. powerful, deep. deep episode here. You guys have not only requested this sister here, but this conversation is so needed. I actually mm -hmm. wanted to have this conversation for a while. But we don't even have conversations until we find the right soul to have it with. Absolutely. And today, y'all, we brought one of my favorite authors on the conversation around trauma. We have a clinical psychologist in the building. We are in here rocking with Dr. Tamer. Welcome to Hardly Initiated. Oh, wonderful to be here. Thank you both for what you do and creating this space so we can all get healed, get whole, and get free. Yeah. You know, I knew you were the right person I had this conversation with, not just by the books you've authored, not because of just the podcast that you have around. You're doing a lot of work mm -hmm. around this conversation of trauma, but you did a TED Talk specifically on intergenerational trauma that everybody needs to listen to. And intergenerational trauma, I mean, that just, first of all, that sounds heavy. Sounds like a lot. <laughs> it sounds it a lot. like a lot. So before we go into it, Give me the just an uh, idea of what that is. Yes. So intergenerational trauma is the wounds that you have inherited from the people who not only raised you, but the people who raised them and the people who raised them. So some of the things that you carry are not from your lifetime, but it's the effects of the stress, the trauma, the racism, the brutality, the violence, that the people before you experienced. It gets passed down. Our Native American siblings call it ancestral wounds. Mm. So what are the wounds? And uh, Dr. Joy calls it post-traumatic slave syndrome. So there's an effect that we carry. Mm. And how, did, how does that even work? Like, yes. how do we get trauma mm -hmm. passed down through birth? How does that work? Yeah. So there are three different ways we can think about the transmission or the passing down of trauma. One of them is neurologically or physiologically. So it's in your body. Trauma affects your nervous system, right? We think about people being vigilant or on edge when we think about um, our folks who are veterans or who have been through a community shooting. It disrupts your nervous system. Mm. And as it disrupts your nervous system, we can also look at shifts in the brain. And then some of the research shows that the descendants of persons who experience those traumas have the same shifts in their brains. So we can pass it down in your body. And that's whether you were raised by your biological parents or not, you can still have that. We also get it passed down uh, by observation. So noticing how the people you ra that raised you, how they navigate the world. If it's around racism, seeing how they adjust themselves in the presence of white people. If it's about assault, seeing how the women in your family may shift in the presence of men. Or mm. these um, lessons, the unspoken lessons of like, should you hold yourself back? Are you safe? Are you comfortable? When should you be on edge? When should you anticipate? You know, we have that message, never let them see you sli uh, slipping, never let them catch you mm -hmm. slipping, yep. right? So, you know, and you, we have that at five years old. People are giving that to little boys, right? The, the posturing that you got to be a warrior at three, you're supposed to be a warrior, mm -hmm. right? So these messages we get 
from observation, but then also direct messages. So if you were ever told things like you have to be twice as good, if you were ever told don't tell people our business, if you were ever told um, that no matter what you're feeling, don't let it show, right? These are the messages uh, that we, is survival strategies. Mm. And one of the things I've discovered is some things that help you to survive keep you from living. Wow. So you got DNA, Mm -hmm. observation, Mm -hmm. and direct messaging. Yes. So you can't escape it. No, it's in you. You you are, yes, we are our choices, but we are also the product of those who raised us and the environment that they grew up in and what they were exposed to because some of the things are not even in our conscious awareness, right? You don't even know you do it. And, you know, if we traced it back, where did you get that from? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing, though. You know, trauma is an aspect of life. Like, I feel like just to watch a lifetime, you experience some degree of trauma. Mm-hmm. So is all trauma passed down or is it based on the level of intensity yeah. of that trauma that typically will go or be able to pass down to the next generation? So I want to first say the reason why what you said is so important is at first when we came, when we were defining post-traumatic stress disorder, the word, the the definition had the word rare in it. And they had to take the word rare out of the definition because trauma is so pervasive, right? That some people don't even realize it would be considered a trauma because they know so many people who have dealt with it, right? If we talk about molestation, some people say like, it happened to everybody I know. Or if we talk about getting jumped on the street. And I was marveling. I have a a daughter who's now 17, but she was in the eighth grade the first time she saw a fight. I was in shock. I can't tell you the first time I saw a fight. I just grew up seeing people fight. All the time. I grew up in Baltimore (laughs) and people fight, right? So some of the experiences, unfortunately, aren't rare. It could be that a lot of people uh, have experienced uh, partner abuse, whether it was them directly or they grew up with that in their household, school violence, school shootings. Uh, So it is common, unfortunately, and then your question about like, what makes the difference? So a part of it can be uh, the severity, um, but we also say that trauma doesn't have a hierarchy. And what I mean by that is some people will try to dismiss their pain because they'll say compared to somebody else, mine wasn't quote unquote that bad, right? So I was talking with a young woman and her, uh, she was upset with herself for not being over it because all her father did was touch her breasts. Right. So there was not penetration. So because she's comparing herself to people who had that, she's minimizing her own pain. Mm. So we have to be careful about even the idea of severity of like who gets to decide how big a betrayal is. Mm. Right. So the the pain uh, is a pain. I will say that uh, there's a difference between what we call acute trauma and complex trauma. So acute is one incident. So if you have been relatively safe and protected your whole life and one time you got jumped and it never happened again, that will be different from someone who experienced it like every day or every week or like it's ongoing. So like the number of times uh, and here's a big uh, piece that predicts how we heal the response to your disclosure, meaning when I share it, did people believe me? Did they comfort me? Did they protect me? Or did they clown me? Did they dismiss it? Did did they blame me that I shouldn't have been walking over there anyway, right? So we can be a part of people's healing by believing and supporting the fact that they are worthy of care. Mm. Now, so a little bit of background about me and Tyshawn. So we actually uh, were operating the business, uh, real estate wholesaling business prior to this. And one of um, the target segments that we would, you know, identify to be able to get these distressed houses were from probate. So these were families who had a house in the family, but for whatever reason, the finances weren't, you know, uh, what's the word? They weren't 
They were broke. They were yeah, and it, it, all, and the family, the family wasn't on the same page. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a lot of turmoil going on mm -hmm. with this particular house because yeah. nobody's on the same page, pretty mm -hmm. much. So nobody had pretty much uh, accounted for these finances or gave somebody leadership role over these finances. Right. So what would happen is, you know, it would be a bunch of disagreements between the family members, mm -hmm. and it comes to the point where the family can't split the house. Mm -hmm. So we would come in and they can split a check because we would buy the house, right? Now, I always thought in my mind, because you could see kind of what was going on with these families. Mm -hmm. And it was always this emotional issues that was happening. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I thought, man, that would never happen to my family, mm -hmm. right? Now we at the point where my grandmother is a lot older, okay? And she doesn't have a, a living will and trust. Mm -hmm. So I come in, you know, I'm the talented grandson who got this financial savvy and i'm like i know exactly what we need to do here i'm gonna pay for the trust i'm gonna get this ironed out and this ironed out right now we get to the conversation mm -hmm. and we can't get a trust put in because my grandmother and my mother have this beef right yeah. keep in mind they've been living together for 20 some odd years mm. right mm -hmm. and i'm talking to one and i'm never I re i'm now realizing that i'm never getting the full story of exactly what's happening yeah. right and they have this really odd relationship to where I would hear something from my grandma that I cannot imagine happening. I cannot imagine my mom saying these things. Hear something from my mom. I guess no way my grandma yeah. <laughs> would do something do like right. that. There's no way. Right. And I'm, and I'm in this place where I'm very confused. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we can't get to the point where we can identify what happens to this asset. So I want to ask you, is, is that intergenerational trauma? Like what exactly is happening here? Because it, it just is just very confusing in terms of what's going on and how could two different generations mm -hmm. come to at least an, uh, an agreeable standpoint to where they can now advance past this? Yeah, I appreciate the example and it's intergenerational conflict. Intergenerational right? conflict. Yes. Uh, and what's powerful about what you said is we have a picture of people that can sometimes make us not believe the fullness of their identity, right? Because we believe people are the way they are with us, but the way they are with you may not be uh, the way they are with other people. But that's why you say like, not grandma, right? right? No way. No, my grandmother wouldn't do that. Not my mother. Uh, but it is over the years what people have been holding, uh, what is complicated and painful, and it also is the symbolism of what the property comes to mean, mm. right? So it's not just about the money. It is about who loves who, who trusts who, who is deserving, who has done enough to earn it. So we have a story that we have created about the people in our lives. Uh, not that it is untrue, it is just that once we get people locked into a box, it's hard for them to get out. So you said they've been living together all these years. Right. These past seven years, they might not have uh, done anything, but I'm not gonna forget what happened in 2002, right? So it is even us unpacking what we mean about forgiveness because you can uh, forgive someone and still not trust them. Because you would say, like, how are we living together? Like, oh, yeah, I'm cool with you enough for us to stay here, but I don't fool with you like that, mm. right? So we have uh, what can appear on the outside to be a functioning, peaceful relationship, but there are all these unaddressed wounds and one of the things that we discover around partner violence is many people will say, many victims will say, it's not just the physical that sticks with you, it's the words, right? We say, would somebody say that? You know, so yeah. we can all go back, I'm gonna say over 10 years, something somebody said to you that stung, that like you remember it well, and we can't take those words back. We can try to like recover and heal, uh, but then, as you're naming, it affects the next generation. Wow. So, intergenerational conflict. That's interesting. So, really, realistically, mm -hmm. past a certain age, yeah. though, is it just safe to say that folks going to just pretty much take them problems to the grave? That's what so, I was thinking. <laughs> like, that's what it's seeming like right, right now. That they're, they're holding on. They're, for people to shift, 
there has to be a motivation and they have to receive uh, the skills and support for the shifting. Because the reason we cling to the familiar is it feels safe, right? So I don't know how to do this other thing. It's like many of our folks were not given the luxury of therapy. So they're like, we just stayed busy and went to church and worked hard. And now you're asking them to like unpack all of that pain. So a part of what helps people to get motivated, uh, including older folks, is when the path they're on is costing them something, mm. right? So now, you know, you won't let me see my grandchildren because you said I'm toxic. Mm. I want to see those kids, right? Or now you, you know, uh, you don't come over for the holidays. or So it is it is something I want differently. And it may not just be about relationships, but also like my own peace, right? I used to, uh, you know, use the phrase of um, you can keep quiet to keep the peace. And then you ask yourself, whose peace am I keeping? Mm. Right? So I'm not talking about it because I want things to be peaceful, but like nobody in this situation is peaceful. And so uh, leaning into it, sometimes it's the modeling. Like if you start to talk more transparently, then sometimes other folks will too, because they see like an example that it, like that the world didn't stop. He told the truth and like we didn't all crumble. <laughs> so. Uh, are people more likely to keep doing what they've been doing? Yes, until or unless something happens that shifts <clears throat> them or awakens them. Uh, and sometimes people get to the point when people joke about uh, senior women who will say anything. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, yeah. you're like, I'm not, I'm not keeping any more secrets. I don't care. Like you, can, you can say like that's freedom, that's liberation. Where I've been holding this you know, for decades, and I don't want to hold it anymore. So, so how, when it, go ahead. Because this, like, uh, this intergenerational conflict mm -hmm. is very common, because I, I speak to men, you know, around my age all the time who have the situation where they grew up where it was two generations of unwed women, Yes. right? Yes. And I've heard men, particularly, you know, just recently, actually, my barber, he says, yeah, man, he was like, you know, I don't know why they be doing all that, making me not want to go over there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't say anything, but I knew exactly what he was talking about. Yes. It's just a very, everything is on pins and needles. Yes. It's the little things. Mm -hmm. It's like, if I go over there and my grandmother is talking to me, my mom will talk louder, <laughs> right? <laughs> if I'm talking to mm -hmm. my mom, yes. my grandma asks me to come back to the room, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So it's this pulling, pulling tug, of, tug war. of war, right? And the thing is, as I know exactly, I don't know exactly what the situation, mm -hmm. the, the, the smaller details, yeah. but I know this is not healthy. Yes, right? it's not. But who is responsible in that household, in that type of environment for being the catalyst for change? Like mm -hmm. how does somebody initiate change if you from the outside know exactly yes. it's unhealthy? Yes, so I would say uh, with intergenerational conflict, if there are children involved, the adults are the ones that are responsible. If now everybody is an adult, anybody can initiate it. Mm. And it may be more likely that the young, the guy you're talking about would be the initiator um, by speaking truth, right? Sometimes it's as easy as saying what you see. So you can say, you know, he could say, it's really stressful to come over here because you all clearly aren't happy with each other. And I love you both. So whoever I'm talking to, I feel like the other person feels betrayed or that I'm being disloyal to them. Mm. So what can we do so that I can still come here and love you both? Right? Wow. And then often I'll say like, no, it's all right. But it's when you put it on the table, it makes people have to see themselves because mm -hmm. they may not even see themselves. Have you ever had that conversation with your people? Have you ever like addressed it in that way not in a way that's like that it and it, not together mm -hmm. just been in a situation where i would just say something like you need to treat my grandma with respect or vice versa mm -hmm. and it's always but she right. but she and you know i get really confused because 
what would happen is it's like these different things would happen on the outside. But then I would hear, for example, my grandma say, you know, I know she mad at me for all these things mm -hmm. from the past, but I just did the best that I can do. And in my, my mind, I'm like, well, that sounds reasonable. You know, that, that sounds reasonable. Why can't my mom just get over this stuff? Like, this yeah. is in the past. You know, look at all these other ways that grandma has came through, particularly for my sister and myself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like she was a big part of our life, which is how we came out the way we came out under all of the, the nonsense that was going on within the household. So for me, I'm like, that's enough. But for her, it's not. It's not. Because you all had uh two different mothers right right your, like your experience of your grandmother is like of course you know because grandma's been great to you right so forgive grandma she's awesome but from your mom's perspective and what i would wonder in this scenario is how much has your grandmother really acknowledged and apologized like like sincerely because sometimes People just say, like, get over it, or I did my best, and it's in a dismissive way. Mm -hmm. So if she could articulate to your mother her awareness of the pain that it caused, right? And that's what your mom may still not be getting. It's like, do you even know what you did to me? Like, mm -hmm. do you, and, and you might be over it, but my whole life has been affected by that. Uh, and it's a hard piece to sit with our mistakes. Right. And, you know, we all want to like quickly move on, especially when you're the harm doer. But the person who is hurting, it's not that they want to be miserable. Right. They're still hurting. And so a part of the freedom uh, can come. In really uh, being accountable and like a sincere apology and to even ask, um, I wish I could go back. I know. Like, we don't get a redo. Is there anything in the present I could do to make things better? I, I like that counsel, especially because you, what you're advising is that I come clean, so to speak, and say, this is how this has impacted me. Yes. Because I, I, neither myself mm -hmm. or my sisters have done that. Yeah. We just have learned to work around it. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so many parents and grandparents and yes. great friends, they don't even know how it impacts the children. Mm -hmm. Because you end up creating all of these, like even when I go over my place, yeah. I have this routine. Like first, I'm gonna go holler my grandma for a second, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to sneak in. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not be too noisy, yeah. not be too excited oh, wow. up in there, right? Wow. Then I'm gonna go around, mm -hmm. spend time with my mom in mm -hmm. this way, and everything is like, and I even know how long I should stay mm -hmm. before it gets, it's gonna get tense. gets too much yes. and gets too tense. And that yeah. is emotional labor. Mm -hmm. You're working. Right. You're working and what's supposed to be like family time. Right. Right. So then that has an effect um, of what and I'll just use you as as an example, but it could be any of us. What are the messages we got in our family that taught us to erase ourselves, to minimize ourselves, to abandon ourselves? So in friendship or in relationship you might center the other person's needs while your own needs are unmet because you're used to doing that, right? So it's like, I'm going to be all right, but are you all right? Mm. And so then we, we lose sight of ourselves. Wow. So I want to ask, so it sounds like the difference between relationship I mean, or intergenerational trauma, and intergenerational conflict, con the intergenerational conflict is the actual problems that we're experiencing with one another between generations where the inter intergenerational trauma are the events that took place that yes. have impacted us. That's right. So with the intergenerational trauma, how will we see that mm -hmm. create other issues in our lives? Like, what does that look like? Because yes. I don't know if a lot of us even know that we're experiencing this. Sure. So, for example, if the people who raised you or aunties or go back in the generations experienced abusive relationships, then even if they don't tell you the details of those relationships, their dating advice will be from a place of uh, hypervigilance, of distrust, um, of settling, uh, the idea of, you know, you don't want to make people too upset or don't um, connect with anybody, don't trust anybody. So uh, whether you know the stories or not, 
<clears throat> the advice you have been given about yourself or about money or about relationships or about where to live, all of that is based in their experience. Mm. And so, you know, it's been um, uh, powerful for me to ask uh, my parents, give them the same scenario and hear a very different response. They grew up very differently, right? Of what they were exposed to, what they had, what they had to navigate. And so, uh, you know, my father's a peacemaker. My, fa- my, my father's a peacemaker. My mother's a warrior, right? So right. any scenario you give her, it's going to be like this. And any scenario you give him, it's going to be like this. But it's like their experience, right? So you want to notice, uh, and some of the stories you will actually know that um, how was my family affected by racism? You know, how, and some people have talked about poverty as a trauma, right? Mm. If, you grew, if your parents grew up not having security in their living or like security about what we gonna eat or having to move from place to place or being dependent on people in shady circumstances, uh, then that affects you. That sense of anxiety, that fear of abandonment, the idea that I have to earn love or like earn the basics, uh, those show up in the way we treat ourselves and the way we relate to other people, even the way we approach work. You know, I was talking to somebody who was at a very uh, unhealthy, toxic job situation, and I brought up the idea of leaving, and she said, oh, Dr. Tama, I only have 10 more years. 10 more years? Like, that's a long time to be in a very miserable place, but like, what were you taught about work? Yeah. Right? That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. just endure and get the check. Yeah. You look, you don't need to be happy. So that uh, teaching, that wounding shows up in us. Uh, difficulty sleeping, uh, our relationship with food. Uh, you know, in some families, wow. the thing that was soothing um, were like uh, carbs and sweets. That's how people showed you they love you, right? Just give you a big heaping plate. But we're not going to talk about the pain, but, you know, he, go feed her, mm. you know, give them three pork chops because we love them that much. So when the love is food and not words or affirmation, then we turn around and give that to the next generation. Oh, my gosh. And that's a lot of our families. Like yeah. we, Oh, my gosh. We celebrate everybody dealing with so much pain, yeah. but we just want to sit down. Eat. We're not going to talk about it. Mm-mm. We're not going to talk about none of that. As a matter of fact, even if you start going there, you'll probably get a look like, oh, yeah, uh-uh. let's, just, let's just enjoy the food. That's yep. Right. Let's just enjoy this meal. Yes. Yes. That's our And we're going to act like none of this that stuff <laughs> ever right. happened. I'm not, I'm not like, I, don't, I can't stand him. <laughs> right. But we're going to eat. And me and you just didn't get into a fight just right. now. Yep. Right. That's it. <laughs> that, like, those are the rules. And it is the illusion of healing. If we sit here and all have this meal then everything must be okay. And it's not. Ooh. Yeah. It's the fake work. Yeah. And I guess you just don't want to, you know, we naturally don't want to feel that pain. So it just feels mm-hmm. a lot better to, to eat, you know, yeah. them, them, them collard greens. Yes. You yes. know, smothered. Right. And everything That's else. It. And not That's actually it. talk about what's going on. Yes. Right. So, wow, you actually really giving me a lot to consider and think about because a lot of our families are dealing with these things in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I never thought food mm-hmm. to be one of the things that we've created as tradition. Yes. As a way to avoid mm-hmm. our, our actual issues. Yes. Yeah. Is there, is, is, there's no healing in that, is there? N- no. What we can think about is coming together can be healing. We can heal while we eat, depending on what we're eating, but that is not a substitute. The problem is when it's a replacement for actual truth-telling. And I will say, uh, even as a minister, because I'm a psychologist and a minister, that another tool we can sometimes use for avoidance is our religion. And what I mean by that is when people spiritualize the issue instead of naming it. So then it becomes everything is a metaphor. The devil was busy. Okay, but like what had, like what did, 
what actually happened, right? So I was coming up the rough side of the mountain and I just prayed and I rebuked the enemy. Okay, but like what happened with your cousin in that back room? Wow. Right? Because if you look, even in a like a worship service, some people are, you know, just giving God thanks, but some people are like in a pit and they trying to shout their way out of the pit, but then they're going back home to that same pit. So we have to talk about uh, the gift of our spirituality, the gift of shared meals, and those are not replacements for truth telling and restoration. So how do I know? How do I know when I'm using? Matter of fact, what is the right way to use religion to heal? Yeah. And how do I know that I'm using it mm-hmm. to avoid my problems mm-hmm. and not heal? Yes. Mm. So one example I will give is we used to have testimony service, right? And in testimony service, people would tell the story of something they've been through and God helped them to get through it. But they would name the thing and that God helped them get through it. And then we got to a place where we felt people couldn't handle our truth. So everybody is speaking in metaphor, right? Nobody's saying STD, nobody's saying abortion. We just like, oh, I was in warfare, right? Everything is, (laughs) right? Right. Everything is a code, right? (laughs) And then we got to the point where we even took the testimony service away. We don't want to hear it, right? We don't want to hear about it. So, The way I know I'm using my faith uh, in a healthy way is that with faith, I can face the mountain. I don't have to run from the mountain, Mm. right? So if you're running, it's just Jesus, 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 Jesus. But what happened? If I can't say what happened, then I'm not set free, right? So when I'm free, then I can shatter shame. I can shatter silence. I can shatter embarrassment. I can shatter humiliation because I know I am more than what I've been through, more than what I have done, but it is a part of my story. So can we sit with our story and feel like with God, I can face even my family drama as opposed to the family saying, let's just pray and everybody eat your food and leave. Wow. So if you, and you know what? It's almost like a like a cut when it when it just happens. If you touch it, how sometimes it can literally still have pain. It can be tender. Yeah. Emotionally, that can happen, too. I remember I was talking to this young lady that I'm dating on the phone and I was telling her about a situation that I realized I don't talk much about. I don't even know how I got here. You know, sometimes you end up in a conversation. I'm like, oh, like, how did I get here? Right. Should I even be saying this? Because right now? this was and actually when I before I even started telling her, I realized it was sensitive. I was like, yo, I actually never told anybody this. Mm. And I started going into it. Mm-hmm. And her response to that, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I didn't like her response to it. And I remember feeling, how did I feel? I I think I felt, I felt hurt in some way by that. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling hurt by Mm -hmm. what I told her because it was a story, like some really embarrassing situation that I would think about my my relationship, something that happened with my relationship with my mom. Mm -hmm. And... I remember feeling that and thinking to myself, I know she didn't mean Mm -hmm. to make me feel that way. Yeah. But the fact that I felt that, I was like, it's something still here. This is unresolved. Mm. Yes. And I remember communicating that because I've been Mm -hmm. working on this. So one, I communicated, Mm -hmm. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should have done that. Actually, I think in that situation, and she was like, what? Like, what do you Mm -hmm. mean? I was like, actually, I think you, in this situation, especially when I give you a disclaimer that I ain't Mm -hmm. never spoke to nobody, I think you need to just listen. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't need all your your comments and stuff Mm -hmm. afterwards. But in general, Mm -hmm. I also stated that the fact that I even felt that way, I can tell that this stuff is not dealt with. Yes. So I think, so if you feel, Mm -hmm. because you just brought this up to me, if you feel embarrassment, Mm -hmm. if you feel shame, Mm -hmm. if you feel these emotions around certain things that's that's happened or has happened in your life, Mm -hmm. is that pretty much the signs that you you have not done with this? Yes, if you uh, feel that these events make you less worthy, unworthy, unacceptable, unlovable, uh, then there is, as you said, there's the tenderness there of what would it be like if I could say this and be fully accepted and fully loved and fully understood, right? Uh, So our 
you know, when we're avoiding things, when we try not to think about it, like there's a reason, right? It still holds a weight. And so to ask myself, what's the story I have told myself about this, right? Mm. So the facts are what the facts were, but is there something I internalized about what this means about me? And do I want to write a new story? And I also appreciate with the, the exchange with the young lady is saying what you would like in the future because people want different things, right? Some people, when, I, when, they, when they say something painful, they want just like silently listen. Some people want like emotional encouragement. Some people want you to give them like a strategy of like how to deal with it, right? Yeah. And if you don't know which one a person wants, then it will feel insufficient, right? So it's help, and that's why your self-awareness is good because some people are upset, but they don't know why. So it's like, okay, what would I have liked? Or they won't say anything. Yes, yes. And then the person has no idea that they did something wrong or that it didn't land well. Yeah. Yeah. So us being able to like talk through tensions or disappointments or frustrations uh, instead of assuming, because we often assume people think the way we think. Right. Because you're like, I would never do that. So like, why would she do that? And it's like, yeah. that's, that's a different person. Uh, but to be able to to get there uh, is important. You know what I thought about? Because I thought about this too when it happened. Because in my mind, not only did I not want her to speak mm -hmm. or make the comment in particular that she made. Yeah. I felt like, and I have a tendency to do this as well. Because mm -hmm. I'm like a smart kid. Mm -hmm. And one of the, I think the downfall of really smart people in general, especially when they grew up smart, kind of mm -hmm. always had the answers, mm -hmm. is they always want to give answers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And they always want to diagnose things. Mm -hmm. And this young lady in particular, she's kind of like that. She was going to kind of give her mm -hmm. synopsis on things. Mm -hmm. When in my mind, and I didn't even communicate this, she's about to find out when she watched this. <laughs> but in my mind, I really was thinking, I didn't even, all I wanted you to do was kind of keep asking questions. Mm -hmm. Like, I just wanted you to kind of let unravel that a bit mm -hmm. and not necessarily be the know-it-all that mm -hmm. I know you are because you really do know a lot. Mm -hmm. But then I thought maybe I shouldn't even say, the reason I didn't say that is because I remember we had somebody up, I can't remember, and what they said was, you got to be careful not to make your partner your therapist, mm -hmm. mm. right? Mm -hmm. So what is the line in yeah. like, how do I, was that unhealthy Right. to, yeah. I, to expect her to go down right. this chain of <laughs> professional questions, uh, you know, to yeah. actually figure out what's going on? Is that, or is that right. not her job right. to do that? Yeah. Is that a healthy expectation? Yes. So let me ask you, what would the questions have represented for you? What would it have meant to you? It would have just been like a genuine curiosity. Right. So I want my partner to be curious about my experience. Yes. Uh-huh. I want, what else? What would you get from the questions? Not only are they curious about my experience, they care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like to show this level of care yes. about what happened. Mm -hmm. To show this level of like delicacy to like want to really even know before they even make mm -hmm. any synopsis. Like mm -hmm. really gather information. Mm -hmm. Like to show this level of like detail in wanting to know me. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. So really all of those things. Yeah. And then let me ask if her summary point, the statement she made, if it had actually been accurate, would it have felt better? After she gained the detail <laughs> or like if she would have just jumped out? Either way, if it was true, if what, if, if she said, and I didn't, you know, I don't know what she said. I don't know the That's situation. I don't, I don't think so. What you don't think which one? I don't that, think if I don't think I would have even wanted a synopsis at that okay. point. Like I don't think that's what I even wanted out of that situation. Now that yes. I think about it, that's okay. not what I what I was communicating. So for. it was both because I was trying to get at was like was it the process that she said something too soon or is it that what she said was wrong? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I think what she said was a little inappropriate. Okay, more so okay. was the situation. Yes, so it didn't match the situation. And maybe if she had asked more questions, she would have known the situation better. Probably so. Okay. So then that is not therapy. That, then that's a help. Like, I want us to dialogue so that you get me, but I'm not asking you 
you know, to be my therapist and take me on some journey necessarily. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's healthy. Yes. To be what? To want to be understood. Okay. Yeah. We want to be, and that's a, you know, we think about our uh, love languages. Uh, one of them is around words. And when people are curious about you, curious about your day, and let me say, uh, as you were saying, recognizing the moment, it's an honor when people tell us things they haven't told other people, right? So that's the other piece is, is to, yeah, as you said, kind of tread lightly, to know this is like, this is tender, because you've known a lot of people, you talk a lot, you have a podcast, you've never like expressed this. So this is a huge moment. So we just wanna like take that into account. And I stopped. Wow. Yeah. Like at that moment, I stopped. Yeah. I did not go any further and deeper. Like mm -hmm. now at that point, it was like, I no longer want to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realized that. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I didn't know. I'm happy you actually made. It's a mm -hmm. difference between wanting to be understood and wanting therapy. Yeah. And I guess yeah. that's where you got to kind of mm -hmm. know the, the spectrum. Yeah. And I didn't really know what the threshold was until you just sure. explained that. So I, I, I do appreciate that mm -hmm. because I don't know if we are even in relationships are traveling, you know, to those places. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, for the ladies, too, we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Jay Barnett came up here and he mm -hmm. said it. He said, the, the way you know where you are, where you stand with a man is mm -hmm. if he's opening up with you about that childhood. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. he's being vulnerable yeah. with you and opening up those wounds. And how you handle that situation when it happens yeah. all important. encourages or incentivizes him to keep going to doing it, to do it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just very important yes. to know when that's happening and to that this navigate is a moment, that properly. Right? This is a significant moment that's happening that I will say. To, for sister's defense, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is do you think she cares? Yes. You know, so the it's that whole thing of intention versus impact, right? So she's trying to be helpful. She does care, but it landed wrong and was premature. Yes. Yeah. But that that having that awareness versus if someone says something ridiculous and it let you know, or and now you believe they don't care. Right, because mm. that's a it's just a different piece when there's love and care here, and you say something that's like off, versus you said something off because this is off. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's okay, you, that's good. Yeah, you breaking it down today. No, yeah. really breaking it down. <laughs> you know, I start sweating a little bit anytime I talk about you know what's going on with us personally because it's just I be thinking about it yeah. real hard. But um, I want to talk to you about this, you know, because you talked about observation. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about observation as it relates to intimate relationships. Yeah. So we have a bunch of men and women who follow the platform. Shout out to all the initiates. And we are now, um, when we encounter people in person and also online that email us, we have both men and women who say, I have no interest in long-term relationships, being married specifically. Mm -hmm. We have, and they still follow the platform, mm -hmm. big supporters. Yeah. We have both men and women who say, um, I have no interest in having children. Mm -hmm. And then we also, you know, have uh, both men and women who mentioned not wanting to be in the relationship. Mm -hmm. A woman wanted to be in a relationship with a man and a man wanted to be in a relationship with a woman. Mm -hmm. Right. So I figured. Who has children? Or no, they don't have children. Women? But okay. it's like, hey, I don't date men mm -hmm. because of X, Y, Z. Okay. So when I hear things like that, because these are. I figured they've been so impacted by observing some level of toxicity in the form of intimate relationship that they don't have no interest in pursuing an intimate relationship with the opposite sex at all, or especially bringing in kids, right? Mm -hmm. And I think about my household and how I grew up, and I think about my sister, because my sister is that person. Mm -hmm. She's like, hey, I got no interest in kids. Mm -hmm. I haven't even known my sister to date anybody seriously, mm -hmm. right? We grew up in the same household, mind yeah. you. But that's how I know you can grow up in the same household with somebody and have completely different experiences. Yes. Now, when I and think the gender piece and the gender piece, because mm -hmm. we're completely different in that way. Yeah. And I think about how we grew up, which is her stepfather and my mother being in a very toxic and abusive mm -hmm. relationship. Yeah. And I can only imagine the messages she was getting mm -hmm. from both people yeah. and what she observed as she was about six years younger than me. But when I think about that, you know, I wonder like, is there some way to combat that? Like, if you observe so much toxicity from the past mm -hmm. and you've now decided that you don't even want to bring kids into the family, right, the next generation, mm -hmm. 
how do you get past that? Is there any way to recover from that to, to now uh, reinvigorate you or reignite your, you know, wanting to bring on family into the next generation? Or is it virtually impossible once you get to a certain age? Mm -hmm. So it re it's, it's two different things, I would say. The not wanting relationships and then not wanting children. So not wanting relationships uh, often comes from disappointment, uh, from pain, from frustration, and seeing a lot of examples where people didn't benefit, mm. right? Um, and there's a, a lot of research even uh, particular that, that talks about once they're married, women feeling like their level of stress increases and men feeling like they have help and support, right? So um, a lot of people will see those examples and say, like, I, like it doesn't look enjoyable to me, right? Mm -hmm. Or it doesn't look safe or peaceful to me. Um, and so what can help to shift that is both seeing other examples of, of when it goes well. It's not perfect, right? People are always gonna have disagreements or what have you, but like, do they even know a couple where both people are being nourished, right? If you can be exposed to see that, then, then it becomes a possibility. But what becomes an additional barrier is, well, that's possible for some people, but is that possible for me? Because some people say, yeah, some people get like this great life, mm. but you know, in what you shared about like uh, her dating history, it may be like that in her experience, it does not feel likely, you know? So at a certain point, having given up on that, that it can feel frustrating for people to keep wanting something they don't have. So then you can shift and say, never mind, I don't want it. Right? Right. So whether it's that I've seen uh, really toxic situations, I've experienced toxic situations, or I don't uh, seem to get a lot of good options. So then let me focus on something else. Um, but one of the things that I tell uh, clients to, to think about is when we have a hyper independence, when you get to a place where like, I don't need anyone, um, then often that is from being perpetually let down. Mm. And so can we, in some ways I say that therapy requires faith, right? Because it means I believe I can have a better life than I have right now. Wow. Right? right. Like, but, like, I haven't been this better person, but I'm going to these sessions or I'm listening to this podcast or I'm reading these self-help books uh, or I'm praying for it because something in me feels like this cannot be enough. Right. That I was made for more than this. So then I got to figure out how do I get there? Now, why is it different? for men and women who may have experienced the same thing. Cause I've talked to a lot of men that's yes. like, well, I grew up just like that, but mm -hmm. they're still like, look, I'm just not going to be that dude. Mm -hmm. And, or on the opposite end, they go still pursue a family relationships, but they just, just as toxic as what they yes. came from. Yes. But then women on the other hand may just say, I don't want have anything to do with any of it. Right. Why is it different? Well, we can think about, uh, we have higher rates of being uh, the abused person. While there are men who have been abused, it's just more likely to be women. Mm. So now you're not just talking about somebody in my house getting on my nerves, right? But now we're talking about somebody who is literally trying to break your spirit. So if they have seen a lot of that, um, financial abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, then you know they're gonna avoid it. The other piece is that um, women are often taught, um, and this isn't everybody, but in general are taught to be more loyal or required to be more loyal. Whereas men may say, I still want a family, but that meant nothing about who they're going to have outside of their family. Mm. So sure, they'd be willing to sign up for that if they feel unlimited by it, unconstrained by it, right? Uh, so that's uh, a part of the, the healing as well. That's a good point, because when I even think about it, when I was, you know, experiencing, you know, the abuse that was taking place in my household, mm -hmm. I never thought, I always thought, hey, you know, I'm going to get this and this and protect my mom. But I never thought that could be me yes. getting right. whooped on. Whereas, yeah. you know, 
on the opposite end of the spectrum, my sister, I'm sure she right. thought like that could literally that be me. That could be me. So who would want to sign up for that? Who would want to risk that? I even had one abuse survivor who said to me, when people talk about like wanting the bad guy, the way she framed it was people who are acting good are pretending and then you gotta wait for the shoe to drop. And when, whereas if somebody is like that from the beginning, you know what you get, it's no tricks, that's, they're an aggressive person and that's who it is. So people have like adjusted themselves to dysfunction in dysfunctional ways, right? Trying to navigate it or survive it. That either I'll silence myself or I'll become very controlling or you know all of these different uh, symptoms but still no peace. Mm. You know, one thing I typically hear men say, and I want to know if this is a myth mm -hmm. or not, but it reminds me of inter intergenerational trauma. Yes. A lot of men, especially the men who've been womanizers, mm -hmm. they're like, man, I hope I don't have a daughter. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? They're like, man, I hope I don't have a daughter because mm -hmm. all hell's going to break loose. Gonna, they're going to come back and get me, right? Mm -hmm. Is that real? Uh, mm -hmm. That is it A man real being that, a womanizer uh -huh. can affect his daughter's ability mm -hmm. to be more susceptible to getting womanized. Yes. Uh, well, it's not just, uh, well, directly or in, in, indirectly. So one of the things it can do is uh, the daughter might believe it is acceptable because we know daddy loves us and this is just what he does. Wow. So if a, a woman grows up in a house with a mm -hmm. father who she sees woman... A father that's a yes, womanizer. But he loves her. But he loves her. That becomes that that's possible, that people can do both. Wow. She right? accepts it. Yeah, maybe. You know, for others, it may be um, that they will highly value uh, loyalty. So they may say, oh, this person, this guy is not the shiniest, not the richest, whatever, but I picked him because he's loyal. Mm. So is, that, yeah. is, it, is it a thing to put to overvalue loyalty? Uh, like, is that possible? Right. Like, because of what you've been through, yeah. you want loyalty so bad that you might take a blind eye to other well, things? It depends on what the other things are, right? Because okay. if they're really not important to you, let's say, you know, I brought up uh, the financial piece. So, you, you know, if these are your options, and this is a false choice, so you should be able to have all the things. But, <laughs> <laughs> right? But if you're Disclaimer. like, yes, you know, this, this guy is wealthy and, I, and a known womanizer, and this guy, you know, is hardworking, makes less than me, but I can trust him. Mm. You know, then you got a choice to make. Yeah. Right? But of course, <laughs> you know, and it's, yeah, of course, there are broke men who cheat. And there are wealthy men who are faithful, but if that's what you're weighing, you know, then then people decide what's most important to me, uh, given my life's journey. You know, uh, interesting. One thing that I've noticed is 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 that as I get older, really every year I get older, I just get closer and closer to some family secret, mm. right? And it's usually just. It's usually trinkled in, like somehow stuffed in there as if, oh, I thought you knew. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, right, getting gaslit. <laughs> or, or they're telling you, hey, hey be quiet because mm -hmm. so-and-so don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So-and-so don't know yes. about this. Yeah. And we even had That's a true. caller, uh, when we, that Dr. Spirit episode we did, which mm -hmm. was excellent. We had a caller call in live, mm -hmm. and she was so hurt because every time she would forgive her parents for a secret, she would later come I to find know. out another secret more secrets mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so why is it that family just chooses to forego all of these important conversations mm -hmm. and just keep it until you get to some till they get to their deathbed or you just get to well somebody some, gotta find out somebody yeah. yeah or you just get to some appropriate age i'm mm -hmm. not sure what what age it, quote unquote appropriate right. age. right yes, right. When yes. That, why why do why do family members do that right they think they're protecting people they think it's uh, safer or better for people not to know. Uh, and a good example around that and how we have seen some shifts is around adoption. You know, back in the day, people didn't say it, but now you'll meet kids and they'll say, I'm adopted, I'm adopted right? right? It's not like you waited till they were 18 and <laughs> then told them, which, you know, some people have done. Yeah. But it be, but in, and those who did that thought they were protecting the child. 
like that we don't want you to feel any different. We want you to feel like you're a part of the family. Uh, but then they may end up feeling like for all those years you lied to me, right? Uh, and the same is true uh, for people's uh, failures or mistakes. It is the idea that our worst moments somehow don't just reflect the person but reflect the family. And we don't want people to think anything negative about our families. So that's why the like, hush, uh, don't judge, you know, all of, all of these things. Uh, one of the painful things with, and there are different types of secrets, but one of the painful things with secrets is often they allow abusive people to continue to have access. Mm. Oh, I've heard many stories about yeah. that, about yes. the uncle yes. who got caught doing something with the younger mm -hmm. niece, but nobody said nothing and he's still around and he yes. done did it to yeah. her daughter whole, and yes. keep, yeah. So multiple people being wounded and then being forced to sit there through family meals and family gatherings or these people coming uh, in and out of your house and you told to go give them a hug, go speak to uncle such and such. So uh, this, again, our word loyalty, sometimes it is selective mm. of who are you being loyal to and at whose cost, who is paying the cost of our silence. Wow. Family secrets, is that a result of intergenerational trauma? Some people have seen what has happened to those who spoke the truth. And uh, often they are not handled well or tenderly or even believed. So let's say, for example, uh, a grandmother, when she was little, was molested and people didn't believe her. She got a whooping for saying it. Then she raised her daughter, same thing happened to the daughter, and she called the daughter a slut because this happened to her even though she was 12 years old. Wow. And now this mother is raising a daughter, and a daughter comes home and says, this is what the guy on the corner did, right? So sometimes we say the intergenerational piece is people think what was done for them is the way to go. So then the message is becomes, Go take a bath. Don't talk about this. You all right. Mm. Yeah. That's truly sad. It is. Because we could get healed and free together instead of making now this daughter feel discardable. And I, I said daughter, but I want to say this also happens to boys. Mm -hmm. And there is an additional layer of don't talk about it with boys. Because if it was a woman who did it, then people will say, you must have enjoyed it. Like they'll high five this little boy, like, ah, oh, your babysitter, you're this, you know, you got it early. You've been macking since you were a little kid. Uh, so, and then if it's a man, then it, then this must mean that you're gay and therefore that you are to blame. So there are all of these messages uh, that keep us in the secrecy. But what's powerful is when one person speaks it. It has a ripple effect. Often it will open the floodgates of the, we say the me too, right? And that being a real piece of I needed to see someone give me permission to tell the truth about what has happened in this family. I could only, because I got a smaller family. Yeah. I could only imagine what's going down in some of those large families. Mm -hmm. Some of those people who got five and six brothers and sisters, the generation before them, it was five yeah. or six of them. Yeah. It's just probably extra chaotic. Yeah. And it is often, you know, one of the difficulties is we often raise children to look out for strangers. But you're more likely to be harmed by someone who is a friend of the family or a family member. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? So that's why we have to uh, create an atmosphere. We can shift the generations in our own parenting or how we are with our nieces and nephews of inviting them to talk openly, right? To not give them the message that we were given to just hold it in. So, you know, it's interesting because I feel like now we're becoming more aware as a generation mm -hmm. of these things that's happening, Yeah, of the stuff that our parents have been through and just mm -hmm. even now how to better process yes. the stuff that we're going through. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues we had, one caller had was, 
she said, yo, my family's like all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I can heal mm -hmm. if I don't have, if I can't really talk to the people that I need to talk to. Mm -hmm. So for the people that's trying to figure this out, yes. and they may have people that have passed away mm -hmm. that they don't have access to, or people that just don't want to straight up change altogether. Yes. Yeah. How does somebody <laughs> like that mm -hmm. find healing mm -hmm. themselves yes. without being reliant on whoever right. may be connected to it? That's right. Great question. So what I like to say is take your healing out of the hands of people who harmed you. You'll be waiting a lifetime. Mm. Talk about, I have to wait for them to apologize. I have to wait for them to transform, for me to transform. I'm not going to hold my healing up for people who are clinging to their brokenness. Right? So then it comes with the courage of I can see myself through my own eyes, even if they don't see it. So they might still believe I'm not worthy. They might believe I'm lying. They might believe it didn't matter, but their reality is not my truth, right? So that's why people talk about chosen family. You know, I have the, my biological family, um, and if that works well, then that's good, but I can also choose the people who, these. this is my family, right? These are the people who love me, who care about me, uh, who honor me, who believe me, and so, um, we may still deal with family, and I would say with boundaries, right? If people are uh, staying dysfunctional, then I might not want to spend my whole holiday at their house. I might co go through, but as you say, you time it, right? Right. So you're like, I could spend this amount of time, right. <laughs> and then I got to go because it's going gonna, it's gonna to become something. And so um, some people we love from a distance, you know, is you, you may not decide you're cutting them off, but you do have to navigate, you know, I like to give people concrete strategies. You might decide you want to sit at the children's table or you might want to volunteer to run errands because mm -hmm. you don't want to sit up there in <laughs> all of that mess. It's like, y'all need something? I'll go, I'll go. Uh, but you, you want to make sure you don't replicate those patterns in your choices. So if you had unsupported family, do you now want to keep hanging out with friends you know don't really like you? Right? That's a rep right. that you're duplicating that same pattern. Or now, like, I'm dating someone who doesn't respect me. My best friend is always talking about me and competing with me. Now I, I have created the same dynamic. Mm. So I didn't get to choose y'all. But the people in my life that I get to choose, I'm going to choose those that are nourishing, that are safe, that care. I'm learning more and more. Uh, that you just you can't run away from your past experiences and f especially when it comes to family because yeah. a lot of us just want to start fresh mm -hmm. and we're like hey I'm good now I'm gonna just continue from here mm -hmm. but in some fashion or form it always manifests itself in how you think and how you take action yeah. so um yeah I'm 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 motivated to uh, take some of these actions and have some of these conversations, yeah. but I'm I'm not excited about it though. Yeah. <laughs> and this I'm message is right real. in time for the holiday. Yeah. Right in time. <laughs> All of us, it's a lot of folks that's gonna to listen to up. this, <laughs> and they think about Thanksgiving to Christmas. They're like, God, uh, I can only because it's a lot of people that when they think about being around family, it's yeah. anxiety that mm -hmm. comes in place. Very stressful. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a it's yes. this emotion that gets it's right. Oh my God, I right. got a lot of friends that will have their friends giving mm -hmm. not because they can't afford to fly back home yes. but, but they don't want to they don't, they don't want, want to have drama. to deal with it yes and um I'm, I'm praying for those people for sure what do, you, what do you say to those people yeah so i would say be selective uh if you're thinking about confrontation or if you're thinking about initiating the dialogue it's not only what you say but where and when and i would say if you're I wouldn't necessarily do it on the holiday. Okay. Right? Because <laughs> just because what's gonna happen is people may unite against you just because they're trying to protect their idea of the holiday. Yeah. Like, you're not gonna ruin my Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so a lot of those. Right. Now, uh if you if you know, let's say the person who harmed you is gonna be there, you may choose not to go. Uh, and, or you may choose uh, to go for a shorter amount of time, or you may try to set up some other time where 
uh, the cousins or the aunt you trust or whoever you feel comfortable with uh, could have the conversation. And if it's going to involve the person who has done the harm, um, I would say thinking about uh, when I'm ready for confrontation, it doesn't matter how you respond, meaning I am not going to fall apart because you say you don't remember it that way, because you say it's my fault, because if you say I deserved it. I need to get to a place where if your response to my confrontation is going to make me unravel more, then I'm not ready. When I'm ready is when I am here to speak my truth. You can say you don't remember. You can say it's not a big deal. You can say whatever you want to say, but I need you to know that I remember what happened and that it was unacceptable, that that was abusive, that that has uh, wounded me. Whether you take responsibility or not, I just need you to know it. Mm. So then they can say, oh, I don't remember. Okay. But so you know. Right. Right. Uh, and then I would say for those who are in the room, if you know it uh, to be the case or you trust this person who is having this brave moment to not demonize them, right? Because that's what sometimes happens. So the person who was harmed is further harmed because everybody thinks they're a villain for telling the truth. Even the people who also been abused by the same yes. person will turn around and do that. Yes. Yep. They'll say, and some people try to use the religion piece and say, we're supposed to forgive. And it's like, uh, there's been no repentance. I haven't heard the sorry yet. <laughs> you know, I'm willing to forgive you. Are you sorry? Or maybe I'm not willing to forgive you. But regardless, people want to jump past accountability and just get to kumbaya. Right, right. right. <laughs> so we to get to peace, we got to go through the, the growing pains and the healing pains. And the last thing I would say on that subject of if your family or anybody else who hurt you is not owning it yet, to not allow their denial to make you digest the lie that you're unworthy. Whether mm -hmm. you have been treated well or not, you are worthy of love and of care. I Listen, love it. That's exactly how we're about to end this here. Dr. Tamer <laughs> came in here and tamed us right. today because we I'm telling one. you, this message is on time and mm -hmm. it's for somebody. And big shout out to all of y'all who in here and is willing to sit here for an hour and figure out how to navigate what you're going through, whether it's something that your mama done put you through or something you done put you through. Much love to you and thank you so much, oh. Dr. Tamer, for coming up here and talking to the family here. Oh. At Harlan this year. That was excellent. I appreciate you, you are welcome. And I just want to say, because I know often we think of ourselves as the victims, but if you are listening and you know you have harmed someone in your family, to take accountability and don't wait for them to have to confront you, for you to initiate the apology and the acknowledgement, uh, because we are not only those who have been harmed, but many of us have harmed others. Mm. That is true. We are, some of us are victims and abusers. Yes. That's right. Many wow. of us. Right. Many of yeah. us. I would agree with that. I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. Life is is dynamic and it complex. Is. Right. It's you might might show up to Thanksgiving uh, ready to address somebody, then you and get addressed. You get and, <laughs> and, and, and usually it might right. be we probably abuse us because we are victims. Uh, right. Yep. So that cycle. It's a vicious, vicious cycle. So you can either oh, get re-victimized or then you start abusing, and we got to break the cycle. I like to say an explanation is not an excuse. So it explains why you are the way you are, but you don't have to stay like that. An explanation is not an excuse. Wow. Oof, that's tattoo worthy right All there. right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, well, look, thank y'all so much. Y'all already know Monday and Wednesday night we will be having our live show at 8 p.m. So make sure you stay tuned. I hope this was healing for your soul. Matter of fact, I know it was. So please share this with somebody that you know needs mm -hmm. this. And if this one here blessed you, I want you to drop a blessed in the comments and tell us how you listen if you really bought that life i want you to tell us how this has changed you go ahead and tell me in the comment section right here below but y'all already know hardly initiated we are out